In part one, we covered the development of plumbing, and in part two here, we're going to cover the bathroom itself. Historically, rich people often had commode toilets with a pot inside, a wooden box or a chair, which the servant would come and empty. So when the rich built their first bathrooms, they encased everything in wood. There were so many fixtures while well, they figured out what people actually needed. That's why this bathroom is so busy. Even when fixtures weren't enclosed in wood, they were pretty fancy and hard to clean. As we noted before, they were still figuring these things out and what it was actually used for. Soon they got simpler and plainer and easier to clean, and they were still, in many cases, fitted into existing rooms with a fair amount of space between them. But in North America, almost everything was being built new, and the American bathroom developed very differently from Europe, where people were mostly renovating. And since bathrooms were expensive, they were designed to be really small. The Statler Hotel in Buffalo, which is still standing, set the standard for bathrooms. It was the first hotel in the world with a bathroom for every room. Here it, is just, here it is today. They say they are fixing it up to reopen, but it never seems to happen. You see the plan here from 1908, the standard bathroom with the tub, the toilet, and the sink all lined up against a wet wall, a big ventilation shaft, and no windows. The standard fixtures became the standard five-foot bathroom. They found it easier eventually to do it five by seven and put the sink on the same wall so that all the planning could line, plumbing could line up on one wall. But basically, the bathroom was designed for the convenience of plumbers, not the health, the comfort, and the safety of the users. Sometimes they were a little bigger, like this one in a Sears house that I saw in Florida. Sometimes designers wouldn't complain that the toilet really should not be in the same room as the sink and the toilet, and that there should be special fixtures for everything. Sitz baths, by the way, are a sort of American or uh, non-French version of the bidet. By the 1930s, the bathroom settled down to be pretty much like it is today. A sink, a toilet, and a tub with a shower head in it. This one from the 50s is unusual. There's a grab bar. Most don't do this because whoever thought it was a good idea to mix a shiny curved surface with soap and water and have people stand in it really didn't know what they were thinking about. An American is killed every day slipping in the shower. It's the dumbest idea for design that anyone ever had, and yet it has been done for over 120 years. The only thing worse than the standard American tub was the sunken tub, all the rage in the 60s and 70s. Imagine the next time you go down a stair that you're putting all your weight in the one foot that's lower and it's on a wet metal surface. The number of people who fell was so huge that they pretty much took them off the market. But they did do some wonderful bathrooms. Back to the basic bath, which didn't change very much. Before people had more than one bathroom in a house, Kohler would promote ideas like this one with two sinks and the mirror floating in between. Fancier tub shapes like this diagonal one, which gives you actually a good seat to slide into the tub with. Fancier fixtures. And the colors. Here's avocado green and glass. But with minor variations, it was all still the same recognizable bathroom. Now it's all regressing back a century with freestanding tubs being all the rage. It's really silly because these are terrible tubs. They're not designed for comfort or safety, but for show. Look at this. It's almost impossible to get in and out of without killing yourself. As you get older, you're supposed to sit on the rim and swing your legs over. But these have no rim. The fashion is to make the rim as thin as possible. There's no wall near most of them to put a handrail on, which every tub should have. This is a fashion design trend that really we should just kill right now. And let's move on to the toilet. Another dangerous and badly designed anachronism. This one is from a Frank Lloyd Wright house in the 50s, but 
you could imagine it being in every bathroom today. Europeans have always sat while they pooped, but our bodies were in fact designed to squat. It's all designed so that the poop can go straight down, and when we're sitting or standing, it is actually bent. This is to make you be able to hold it in. It adds to continence. It keeps it all in. In Asia, you often see squatting toilets, which are in fact much better for your body. Unfortunately, they're not always as clean as this, and they often smelled because the poop is sort of on that shelf there rather than underwater. In the 60s, a scientist at Cornell University, Alexander Kira, started looking at the American washroom and demonstrated how much better squatting actually was. He studied everything, including where all the pressure was on the bones when we sat on seats and how you could redesign it so that we could still sit, but it would be more comfortable. Here was his final toilet design, sort of half squatting, half sitting, much lower than the current ones, because it was low and shaped differently so that different parts of our rear end actually supported ourselves. He had a separate pull-out urinal on top for men. The sink was redesigned too, with a spout that would go up and over, the water would fall down, and it would actually self-clean the sink, much like those round ones you spit into at the dentist's office. When he looked at the standard shower-tub combo, he made it safe and comfortable, with handrails, with a contoured back, with lots of grips, and with a hand spray instead of a shower head, so that you can actually clean yourself. He was actually probably responsible for the death of the sunken tub, because he pointed out all the things about the weight going on to the lower foot, and suggested that, in fact, tubs should be raised. And what do we have today? Not only is everything Kira predicted or talked about being ignored, but it's getting worse as older or obese people have trouble getting off a low regular toilet. So now they are sold, quote, comfort height toilets that are like sitting on a dining room chair. So older, sicker people get a toilet, which makes it even harder to poop. It's exactly the wrong thing to do, causing constipation, hemorrhoids, and worse. One person thinking about it is Ivan Gochko in Toronto, who's actually invented a new toilet that has the best of everything. It had to solve a pro it invented it to solve this problem. It moves up and down. His grandma was sick and was having so much trouble with the toilet. And so here you get on when it's at high chair height, you press a button and it drops down. It's got armrests, it's completely self-washing, and it has a vacuum system so that it uses almost no water. The only problem with it is it costs 10,000 bucks, but at least he's thinking about the problem. And this is a more economical model that just goes up and down that he's developed for nursing in old folks' homes. It has fewer bells and whistles. There's another fixture we have to discuss, the bidet, which was very popular in French. The French thought about very differently about cleanliness than the rest of the world. They thought toilets were disgusting and didn't want to have them in their houses at all. When they brought them into the house, they hid them away in tiny closets. Traditionally, the French didn't bathe or shower very much either. One study found that the French see a little bit of dirt not as the enemy, but as being good for the terrain and worth cultivating. Sensibilities in French, France also remained more tolerant of natural body odors. Le Corbusier, as I noted in my minimal, minimalism lecture, thought very differently about this and had showers and tubs long before they were popular. In his own apartment, the master essentially had his and hers bathrooms with a shared toilet. His wife Yvonne's bidet was right out in the open in the middle of the room this really embarrassed her, actually, and she cro crocheted a cover for it, which she put on when she was entertaining guests. Corb had his own special sa shaving sink, a big shower stall, stall, which is unheard of, and the toilet, like I said, squeezed off in a tiny closet. You see a similar setup in the Maison de Verre, where every room had a sink and a bidet behind a movable screen, 
but the toilet's in a tiny closet down the hall. Anyone outside of France seeing a bidet, they really didn't know how to use it or what it was for. The first time I ever used one, I stood over it while I turned on the valve and I got a face full of water. But the idea of the bidet has evolved. I have one and recently wrote about it in this article, Can't Find Any Toilet Paper? Get a bidet. People are hoarding toilet paper, but I don't care. I don't need any. I have a bidet attachment on my toilet. Invented in 1980 by Toto in Japan, the idea was simple to integrate functions of the European bidet, a type of sink for washing the buttocks, into an electric toilet seat. It's cleaner, it's healthier, it saves the tons of the water used to make toilet paper, and of course it saves all those trees. Everybody is making them now, like Kohler with their new me, so beautiful you can put it in the living room of your case study house. There it is again. What a conversation starter that would be. Here's another brand. They keep showing them out in the open instead of a separate room like they do in France. But they should be in separate rooms for smells and to keep the bacteria in the toilet room. Studies have shown that if you flush a toilet with the lid open, you can contaminate a toothbrush three meters away. That's why when I designed my bathroom, I put the toilet in its own room. The sink is in the hall so that it's accessible to everyone, and it's kind of an homage to Le Corbusier. Here's the sink in the hall with the tub and the shower behind. The toilet's in its own room with the Toto Bidet toilet seat. So remember when you design bathrooms, in case anybody wants to get one of these, put an electric outlet behind the toilet. Another view of the whole overall lower level with the sink. The tub is in the same room as the shower, but they're separate, with one control set between the two. The tub is extra long, even though I'm extra short, so that it's extremely comfortable. I did not install grab bars, but I have wood blocking behind the tile so that I can easily. And by the way, you don't have to spend $1,200 on a Toto or $6,000 on a Numi. You can add a fresh spa for 50 bucks. I used to have one of these and it really worked well. And you didn't even mind the cold water all that much. This is why I always get cranky when I see these visions of bathrooms of the future. They're always about the electronics and never about the people. So when you look at them, it's just the same old thing with screens. This is one of the worst, the computer sitting on the toilet, so you can get fecal coliform all over the keys when you use it there. Toilet paper you can't reach, the shower stall is too small to actually have a decent shower, and all those steps around the tub. Or this one, again, an open toilet to contaminate the air in a big room, which you have to overheat to take a shower because it is no enclosure, a shiny floor that you will slip on when you step out of the shower. A couple of years ago, I wrote an article where I designed my imaginary bathroom, which isn't that similar from the one that I actually built. It would have a Japanese bath just like this, with the separate shower, as you see here, and a beautiful view out into a garden. As Alexander Kira suggested, it would have a low toilet and a separate urinal. You can see here this Japanese bath on the left, in the middle is the traditional Japanese datsuba transition space where you remove your clothes and a good place for the washer and dryer too. To the right, I have a low Alexander Kira toilet and a separate urinal. I'm sorry the shower head is up in the sky on the right, but I'm terrible in sketchbook. The final thing I want to talk about is air quality. Bathrooms are small and often have a virtually useless fan. Yet we store the most toxic chemicals in the house there. We shouldn't use this stuff in the first place, but if we do, it should not be in the bathroom. It should be in a separate space, and better care has to be taken with ventilation. A few years ago, I tried to have the class do a residential version of the Well Standard, and I did the bathroom page. You can see here, really a summary of all the rules. For the bathroom design, have separate areas for washing and excreting. Uh, the toilet should have a bidet attachment. 
consider separate urinals. The tub and the shower should be in separate places and have non-slip shower with rails. Storage of cosmetics should be minimized or eliminated. Do not store them in the bathroom. Bathroom finishes should all be washable and non-slip. Ventilation should be running constantly, connected probably to a heat recovery ventilator, and have a separate exhaust for the toilet enclosure. Finally, provide a floor drain and ensure the entire floor surfaces slope to the drain. The bathroom's incredibly complicated. I haven't even talked about the amount of water that we take out of the lake to run our bathrooms or the fact that we put it back nice and dirty just a few kilometers away. That's another story altogether. I have just stayed inside here. But the next time you use the bathroom, think about the why the way it is, how you could make it better, and in these crazy times, sing a song while you wash your hands. Thank you.